Am Dienstag kam es zu einem Zwischenfall vor der Krim-Halbinsel, bei der eine US-Drohne zum Absturz gebracht wurde. Können Sie uns mehr zu dieser Drohne sagen, was sie für Fähigkeiten hat und was Ihrer Meinung nach tatsächlich vorgefallen ist? On Tuesday there was an incident of the Crimean Peninsula in which a US drone was brought down. Can you tell us more about this drone, what its capabilities are and what you think actually happened? Well, this is the MQ-9 Reaper drone. It's a um, an improvement over, uh, I think, the, um, the its more famous predecessor, the Predator drone, uh, which was, of course, the first armed drone. Uh, the MQ-9 Reaper has greater range, greater capabilities, greater payload, uh, sort of like a bigger brother of the uh, of the Predator. Um, it it ha was used extensively in the uh, war on terror in uh, Afghanistan, uh, Iraq, and um, Syria, Yemen. Um, and it has a reputation of both being able to um, loiter over an area for a long time, identify targets, and then kill targets. Um, so it has this oversized reputation. Uh, the problem is it wasn't designed for modern warfare. So it has zero survivability in modern warfare. Um, what it was doing in Crimea is simple. It was provoking Russia deliberately on a in an intelligence gathering mission um, that Russia had every right to believe was being used to support Ukrainian military operations targeting Russians, which means that it wasn't a uh, it, this wasn't innocent passage. This was actually a flight undertaken by an aircraft that was an active participant in the conflict. Uh, Russia had declared the airspace off of Crimea to be an exclusionary zone, as it has every right to do um, in times of national security and sensitivity. But the United States doesn't recognize Russia's um, sovereignty over Crimea. They claim that Crimea is Ukrainian, and therefore Russia has no right to exercise any exclusion zone. Um, and so what the drone was doing was deliberately provoking the Russians by flying a flight path into the exclusion zone in the hopes of getting the Russians to turn on uh, their signals, their communications, their radars, and which would then be collected by a intelligence collection pod under the left wing of the aircraft. Um, so not only was this a provocative act, it was literally an act of war because the intelligence being collected would be shared with the Ukrainians who would use it to target Russian troops and Russian equipment. And so Russia um, gave the drone every opportunity to leave the area. 19 passes of Su-27 fighters, 19 times they flew by in a clear signal to leave the area. And when the United States persisted, Then they used other tactics, um, in this case, the spraying of uh, fuel, dumping of fuel onto the uh, platform to um, to bring the drone down. And um, that's that's where it is. Uh, the drone right now is um, in the Black Sea, on the bottom of the Black Sea. Uh, Russia is trying to recover debris that might provide some uh, intelligence, uh, information of intelligence value. And the United States is claiming that um, it will continue to Uh, carry out its rights to fly. And uh, indeed, they have flown another MQ-9 Reaper drone in that vicinity. Um, and, uh, and, and we'll see where it goes from there. Der russische Botschafter in Washington, Anatoly Antonov, meinte dann am Mittwoch, dass Russland niemandem mehr erlauben wird, in den eigenen Luftraum oder territorialen Gewässer einzudringen. Hat sich hier etwas in den sogenannten Rules of Engagement geändert und was hat das für Konsequenzen? The Russian ambassador in Washington, Anatoly Antonov, then said on Wednesday that Russia will no longer allow anyone to enter its own airspace or territorial waters. Has something changed here in the so-called rules of engagement, and what are the consequences? I mean, because so much has happened in the last year, people forgot that in the summer of 2021, uh, the British uh, Navy um, sailed a destroyer along the coast of the uh, of Crimea, again, into waters that Russia deemed to be exclusionary in nature because of military exercises. And the Russians at that time fired warning shots at the uh, destroyer. Um, 
But the British claimed that they had every right to be there because, again, Russia doesn't control Crimea and it has no right to make an exclusionary zone. The Russians made it clear afterwards that any ship that did that again would be sunk. No questions asked. And no ship has gone in there again, uh, despite the British and the United States claiming they have every right to do this under innocent passage. There's nothing innocent about British and American warships sailing close to Crimea. It's a deliberate provocation, and it's done for intelligence purposes. Uh, the same thing now has happened with the drones. The Russians have drawn a red line, and they've said that this will not be allowed to uh, occur ever again. And um, we'll find out if the United States um, believes them or not. Will the United States go the path of Lindsey Graham? Uh, seeking to bring up American fighters to escort the drone. Um, Marco Rubio, who said that we should shoot down Russian fighters that uh, enter international airspace near uh, an American drone. Um, either one of those actions could provoke uh, an escalation of the crisis, uh, like the nuclear war. Or will we do what we always have done? Lindsey Graham brought up the memory of Ronald Reagan, you know, the great American conservative president. Um, I would remind Lindsay that Ronald Reagan signed the Intermediate Nuclear Forces Treaty and began the process that, uh, you know, had the Soviet Union reclassified from um, the evil empire to a friend. Um, and Ronald Reagan, during Ronald Reagan's time, there were numerous confrontations between American and Russian or Soviet military along the periphery of the Soviet Union to include um, ships ramming American ships to keep them away from the Crimean coast. Um, American aircraft being fired upon uh, by the by the Soviets. So um, what would Ronald Reagan do? Ronald Reagan would have been a mature individual and not sought to, unne to needlessly escalate a conflict that was provoked by American provocation, not Russian provocation. Um, so Lindsey Graham needs to be corrected. He's wrong on the history. He's wrong on his assessment and he's wrong on his, um, you know, his, his, uh, Prescription on how to, how to fix this. Wir erleben in vielen ehemaligen Sowjetrepubliken wie Kasachstan, Georgien, Moldawien oder Aserbaidschan, wie die USA mehr oder weniger aggressiv versuchen, die Regierungen zu einer antirussischen Politik zu drängen. Was wird damit bezweckt und wie gefährlich ist das? We are seeing in many former Soviet republics, such as Kazakhstan, Georgia, Moldova or Azerbaijan, how the USA is more or less aggressively trying to push the governments towards an anti-Russian policy. What is the purpose of this, and how dangerous is it? You know, we get we we get insights when we listen to people talk about um, U.S.-Russian relations in the age of Vladimir Putin. Um, the first thing is that the West has a very shallow interpretation. Uh, of the Russian president. Um, and by shallow, I mean inaccurate. They they call him a dictator. Uh, they claim that he um, he alone makes every decision. I mean, everything is Putin's fault. Um, and, and that's just, it, it's it's embarrassingly amateurish, but that it's real, it, 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 it exists. And we also have a, a similar attitude towards Russia. We don't respect Russia. And the biggest example of the lack of respect is how we thought economic sanctions would cause Russia to collapse. Uh, we didn't respect the resilience of the Russian economy, the depth of the Russian economy, the flexibility of the Russian economy, and the fact that the Russian economy not only did not collapse, but recovered quickly from the extraordinarily, uh, extraordinary unprecedented level of sanctioning that was put on it. Um, so we're ignorant about Russia. And so when you combine those two, Uh, the animosity uh, with the ignorance, you can allow yourself to come up with very simplistic policies that are designed to contain and destabilize Russia. And that's what this is. Uh, when we take a look at what the United States is doing in the former Soviet republics on the periphery of Russia, the idea is to create a crescent of chaos, a crescent of crisis. Uh, that would weaken Russia and ultimately cause Russia to collapse from within because strains economically and politically that we would be putting on Russia. Um, it's, this policy is doomed to fail um, for many reasons. 
Um, but it is the policy of the United States. Let's take Georgia, for instance. What is taking place in Georgia? Back in um, 2012, I believe, uh, Bidzina Ivanishvili, uh, a, a businessman, a billionaire who made his money in Russia, became uh, president. He replaced uh, Saakashvili, who was a uh, sort of a well-known Georgian nationalist uh, who had uh, helped take Georgia into the camp of the West after the Rose Revolution, uh, which again was a U.S. funded, U.S. supported effort to seize control of a nation in the in the Russian near abroad. Um, and ever since then, his Georgia Dream Party, his friends, Virginia's uh, a, a political party, has been in power in the parliament. Um, and this is not the direction the United States wants Georgia to go. So what has the United States been doing? And this is the reason why I'm talking about Georgia. It's the same thing we do in all the other republics. We use uh, innocuous seeming aid money um, to come in through the U.S. Agency of International Development. And we fund uh, social development programs that are designed to empower um, a new class of citizen, a woke class, a, a liberal progressive class that identifies more with the United States and the European Union than they do with their own country and their own country's historic and cultural values. And they so they they build up at the at the grassroots level these social movements. Then they enact um, elect electoral change. Uh, which we call reform, but it's not reform. It's designed to change the way that these nations conduct elections so that these uh, social, th these grassroots movements become empowered from the bottom up. So we now create election procedures and processes that block what the current ruling class is doing and empower from below this other class. And then in the name of countering disinformation, in creating societal resilience to disinformation, we come in with programs that allegedly, you know, advocate free speech, but it's not. What they do is they suppress any opposition to what the United States is doing in Georgia in the name of misinformation, propaganda, et cetera. Uh, and then anybody who opposes this becomes pro-Russian. And so the United States sought to turn the Georgia Green Party into a pro-Russian party. Now, they got called out because the uh, Georgia Dream Party um, was, tried to pass legislation that uh, the Foreign Agent Registration Act. Now, it's curious. Uh, as soon as they tried to do this, the United States and the European Union screamed, no, you can't do this. This is anti-democratic. You're going to be suppressing the free will of the people, et cetera. But the United States has a Foreign Agents Registration Act that the Georgian one was modeled on. And the European Union's in the process of enacting its own. Foreign Registration Act. Why? Because they understand how foreign money can come in and corrupt the integrity of uh, what are supposed to be internal policy uh, actions. So there's nothing wrong with reform, but when the reform is solely funded by foreigners who are using the reform, not for legitimate reformation, but to seize control, then it's a problem. The best way to deal with that is through transparency, by compelling those who receive this money to declare this money. Russia did this back in 2012 uh, when they uh, called out the various non-governmental organizations that were being funded by the West as little more than not only propaganda, but um, agents of um, insurrection trying to you know, create an op a political opposition to overthrow Vladimir Putin. Again, there's a theme here. Um, in Georgia, it it's a very tense situation We're trying to get Georgia to um, the United States is trying to get Georgia to um, sign on the sanctioning of Russia. And some extremists are trying to get Georgia to open up a second front, uh, a new war um, uh, against Russia in order to help alleviate the uh, pressure that's put on Ukraine. Um, they've been stymied by Georgia Dream, which rather being weakened, you know, Georgia Dream had to withdraw this uh, this uh, foreign registration law. Um, because of the fear of violence. There was the real chance of political violence taking place. So in order to preserve public safety, they withdrew the law. But that didn't mean they lost. Uh, 
instead, Georgian society came out and has demonstrated in support of Georgia Dream. So we don't know which direction Georgia is going to go. But this is what the United States does. And nations need to understand that the United States does not approach you with money out of the goodness of their heart. The United States doesn't care about you. We really don't care about anybody. We're buying you to do something that benefits us. And what are we asking you to do? To create chaos. Chaos that leads to confrontation. Confrontation that leads to conflict, which leads to dead Georgians, dead Azerbaijanis, dead Uzbekis. We don't care. The more of you that die, the better the grit, the scope and scale of the conflict is, and the happier we are. We bathe in your blood. And that's what people need to understand. Don't take the American dollar. Focus solely on what is good for you. Now, again, if Georgia woke up in the morning and on their own volition said, we want to be members of the European Union because that's the right thing to do for Georgia. You know who wouldn't oppose them? Russia. Russia would say, you're a sovereign nation. You have every right to do that. Please. If Georgia woke up today and said, we feel that our economic well-being um, is centered on Washington, D.C., not Moscow. So we're going to have a strategic relationship with Washington, D.C. Russia would say, you're a sovereign nation. You get to do that. As long as it's not a military relationship. We don't want hostile foreign actors to come to us. But Russia would also say, understand that you're making a decision. You're making a decision to align yourself with somebody who is openly hostile to Russia, which means you can no longer be counted as a Russian friend. And therefore, the nature of our relationship will change. For instance, if we are providing you with energy at below market prices, we may no longer provide you with energy at below market prices. But it's your choice. You're a sovereign country. Russia has no problem with that. Russia is not trying to dictate outcomes. The only people trying to dictate an outcome is the United States. And the outcome they're trying to dictate isn't for the benefit of the nations they're supporting. It's for the benefit of the United States.